France's North American colonies, 1534 to 1763. French exploration of North America began in earnest in 1534, when Jacques Cartier crossed the North Atlantic and entered the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Ships from various countries had fished the waters off Newfoundland since 1497, when John Cabot returned to England and reported great schools of cod there. But Cartier's expedition was the first to penetrate Canada, a name of Indian origin for the land he and his countrymen called New France. Like Columbus, Cartier hoped to find a passage to the Indies and return to Canada in 1535 to explore that possibility. At first, the broad St. Lawrence looked promising, but it narrowed as he and his crew proceeded westward, and soon they encountered rapids that proved impassable. This was no passage to India, but the countryside along the St. Lawrence looked fertile and inviting. Climbing a hill he dubbed Mont Royal, Cartier admired the broad river valley. It was, quote, the most beautiful land, he wrote, covered with the most magnificent trees, end quote. By then it was autumn, and he spent the winter in a fort near what is now the city of Quebec, enduring harsh weather and strained relations with nearby Indians. Cartier did not help matters by seizing a tribal chief and several of his people the following spring and carrying them back to France against their will, a common practice among European explorers visiting the New World. Cartier returned to Canada in 1541 and founded a settlement at Quebec. It lasted only two years before the colonists headed home, discouraged by the harsh climate, the inhospitable Indians, and the absence of precious metals. Europeans remained obsessed with finding mineral wealth in the New World and paid little attention to other resources. By 1600, however, there was a demand in Europe for beaver pelts used to make hats. Beaver abounded in the colder regions of North America, and that profitable trade helped spur the development of New France. In 1608, Samuel de Champlain founded the first permanent French settlement in Canada at Quebec. Champlain understood that the French would need Indians as allies and trading partners in order to succeed in the fur trade, and he forged ties with several tribes, notably the Huron, living between Lake Ontario and Gordian Bay. Soon, Jesuit missionaries from France were living among the Huron and introducing them to Christianity. The French introduced diseases to the Huron, however, which made them vulnerable to attack by their rivals, the Iroquois, who lived in what is now New York State and resented French intrusions to their north. In years to come, the French and their Indian allies remained at odds with the Iroquois and the English, who soon supplanted the Dutch in New York and took over the fur trade. Despite this ongoing rivalry, which flared up periodically into bloody, bloody fighting, the colony of New France grew and prospered. Enterprising fur traders called uh, uh, voyagers set out from Quebec and the nearby town of Montreal, founded in 1642, and ranged far to the west, traveling along rivers or lakes and portaging their canoes from one body of water to another. By 1670, the French had a trading post. Um, Marie and... Marie and were exploring Lake Superiors in Michigan. Uh, the founding of the Hudson Bay Company by the English that same year provided competition for the Canadian fur trade and encouraged the French to broaden their scope. Missionaries sometimes accompanied the voyagers, many of whom married women from local tribes, fostering a mixed race, the Métis. Meanwhile, Montreal, Quebec, and other settlements along the St. Lawrence were gradually increasing in population as new colonists arrived from France and raised families. French authorities expanded the colony by granting territory to landlords who then recruited settlers called habitants and provided them with homesteads around 100 acres in exchange for rent and services. The system was based on feudalism, but unlike serfs in Europe, settlers in New France had a legal claim to their land and could deed it to their descendants. After, after um, reconnoitering the Great Lakes, 
French explorers began pushing southward along the Mississippi River and its tributaries. In 1673, Father Jaquez Marquette and French-Canadian Louis Joliet, traveling by canoe with five voyagers, paddled far down the Mississippi River, past the mouths of the Missouri and Ohio Rivers, before turning back. The venturesome French Frenchman René uh, Cavalier, uh, Sieur de la Salle, reached the mouth of the Mississippi in 1682. At La Salle claimed for France all the country watered by the Mississippi and its tributaries, including such great rivers as the Ohio and Missouri, which extended a thousand miles or more in either direction. Known as Louisiana, in order of King Louis the Fourteenth, this vast country extending from the Appalachians to the Rocky Mountains went largely unsettled by the French, and both Spain and England contested La Salle's claim. Nonetheless, uh, what Spain and England contested, France made something of his initiative by planting settlements along the Lower Mississippi River, notably the town of New Orleans, founded in 1718. French planters there imported African slaves to raise rice, tobacco, and other crops. The French population of New Orleans and environs was bolstered in the mid-1700s by the arrival of several thousand Acadians exiled from their homeland in Nova Scotia, uh, which had been disputed between England and France and came under British control by the treaty in uh, 1713. The treaty under which France lost Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and other territory to Great Britain as England became known after its union with Scotland in 1707. Again, um, when Great Britain, um, England became known as Great Britain when after its union with Scotland in 1707. It brought an end to Queen Anne's War, one of several conflicts between the two powers that culminated in the British conquest of Canada. These wars were related to hostilities in Europe, but hit home with brutal intensity in North America, where colonists enlisted Indian allies in merciless raids on opposing settlements, and many civilians were killed or captured. After King George's War ended inconclusively in 1748, the French tried to halt the westward expansion of the British, who far outnumbered French settlers in Canada. By occupying the Ohio Valley... <clears throat> British colonial authorities responded in 1754 by sending mil militia under George Washington to challenge the French and their tribal allies at Fort uh, Duquesne in present-day Pittsburgh. George Washington lost in a battle at Fort Necessity that inaugurated an epic conflict known to British colonists as the French and Indian War, which was linked to the Seven Years' War in Europe. At first, the French fared better in this struggle because they had superior commanders, and far more Indian allies. In 1758, the British gained the upper hand by shipping more troops to North America and ending the forced recruitment of colonists, who responded by enlisting in large numbers. In 1759, British troops captured Quebec and took control of Canada. Elsewhere, savage fighting continued between British colonists and Indian allies of the French until peace was negotiated in 1763. France renounced to Britain not only Canada, but also all of Louisiana east of the Mississippi except New Orleans, having ceded it and in the western portion of Louisiana to Spain the year before. The French adventure in North America had come to an end. And so that came to an end with France uh, renouncing to Britain, Canada, and then all of the territory of Louisiana east of the Mississippi minus New Orleans having ceded it in the western portion of Louisiana to Spain the year before that, in 1762. England's North American colonies, 1584 to 1775. In 1584, explorers sent out by Sir Walter Raleigh, who held a grant from Queen Elizabeth I to colonize the New World, found a likely site for settlement on Broanoke Island. In 1585, settlers arrived at Roanoke off the coast of what is now North Carolina, inaugurating the first English colony in, Mer in America. Short of provisions, they grew independent on Indians for food and ended clashing with them and abandoning the island. 
A second expedition in 1587 brought a party that included women and children to Roanoke, where they too suffered from lack of supplies. And so, as you know, um, the set settlement of Roanoke in 1585 uh, was the first English colony in America. Uh, their leader in 1587 was John White, who returned to England for help, leaving behind his married daughter and her infant, Virginia Dare, the first English colonist born in the New World. Um, war between England and Spain prevented White from returning to Roanoke until 1590, and he found the settlement deserted. The fate of White's lost colony still remains a mystery to this day. Uh, no one knows where the hell they went. Uh, similar trials beset the next English colony in America, founded in Virginia in 1607 at a site called Jamestown in honor of King James I. Located in a marshy area along the James River, the colony was plagued by malaria. Hostilities, disease, and starvation nearly wiped out the colony, but new settlers arrived and began working the land. They found a cash crop in 1612 when colonist John Wolfe succeeded in growing tobacco. This set the stage for colonial expansion, but settlers first had to reckon with fierce resistance from Powhatan, leader of a confederacy of Algonquian tribes. Powhatan relented after the English capture of his daughter Pocahontas, who wed John Wolfe. John Wolfe. By the 1650s, tobacco had become the mainstay of the colony. Planters immigrated to Virginia, and they received land grants that varied in size depending upon how many people they brought with them. Most plantation workers were indentured servants under contract to their employers for several years. Only a small number of blacks arrived in Virginia in the 1600s, and they were treated much like white servants who were readily available but yet his planters had little reason to invest in slaves. A similar plantation economy uh, developed in the colony of Maryland, founded in 1634 by the Calverts, aristocrats seeking a refuge for their fellow Catholics. Most who settled there in Maryland in 1634 um, were Protestants, and they eventually curtailed the rights of the Catholics. Religious intolerance drove many colonists to America, uh, but intolerance did not end there, however. Um, among the religious dissidents seeking refuge in America were the Puritans, or that were Protestants at odds with the Church of England. Some Puritans were ready to separate from, what, from that faith and from England. One such group of separatists migrated first to Holland in 1608 and then sailed for the New World aboard the Mayflower in 1620, landing on Cape Cod. They called themselves pilgrims and settled at Ply Plymouth, where they met with Indians who had been devastated by diseases communicated by earlier European visitors and wanted to avoid hostilities. The settlers learned from them how to plant corn and other native crops and joined with them to celebrate the harvest in 1621, the first Thanksgiving celebration of 1621 at uh, Cape Cod. Um, anyway... This small Plymouth economy endured, but it was soon eclipsed by a massive colonization effort by Puritans who reached Massachusetts Bay in 1630 and founded the town of Boston in 1630. And nearby settlements, the Puritans did not start out as separatists, but they took advantage of their newfound freedom by dispensing with Anglican rules that gave bishops authority over local parishes and instead granting each congregation the liberty to stand alone, as one minister put it. That did not mean colonists could worship as they pleased. Uh, Massachusetts was strictly Puritan, and nonconformists had no place there. Uh, two notable dissenters, Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson, found refuge in the colony of Rhode Island in the 1630s. Other religious nonconformists left Massachusetts to settle in Connecticut. But the main reason colonists spread across New England was a desire for good land, a precious commodity in a region where much of the soil was thin and rocky. The poor treatment of Indians by settlers who encroached on their land infuriated Chief Medicament of the Wampanoag. Known to the English as King Philip, he enlisted other tribes in a fiery uprising in 1675. Some 600 colonists in Massachusetts were killed and many captured before the English struck back and won King Philip's war with the help of the Iroquois. Later, 
Towns in Massachusetts and New Hampshire suffered attacks by the French and their Indian allies, who resented the English, who sided with their enemies, the Iroquois, and expanded towards Canada. English colonists also faced competition from the Dutch, who founded New Amsterdam on the island of Manhattan in the early 1600s. Dutch ships delivered colonists from Holland and other countries to the town's splendid harbor and returned to Europe laden with beaver furs acquired from the Iroquois. New Amsterdam proved an irresistible target for the English, who sent a fleet there in 1664 and seized the prize. Renamed New York, the town outgrew Boston as a port city and was surpassed in colonial times only by Philadelphia, founded by William Penn, a Quaker who envisioned a peaceful kingdom in Pennsylvania and discouraged the abuses that inflamed Indians and other colonies. Here, as in nearby New Jersey and Delaware, much of the land was cultivated by independent farmers, including German settlers called the Pennsylvania Dutch. A far different economy, one based on slave labor, developed in English colonies to the south of the late, in the late 1600s. Planters in Virginia found indentured servant, servants harder to obtain as conditions in England improved. The planters feared losing control of the colony as servants released from their indentures pressed westward in search of land, inciting costly Indian uprisings. In 1676, Nathaniel Bacon of Virginia led a frontiersman who favored aggressive westward expansion in a revolt against the colony's governor. Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion collapsed after Bacon fell ill and died and British troops arrived to bolster the governor. However, the revolt reinforced the growing preference of Virginia's planters for a slave labor force that would remain perpetually in bondage. In the 1690s, the English slave trade, a long, long been monopolized by a single company, became more competitive and the price of slaves fell. In the young colony of Carolina, later divided into North and South Carolina, owners of rice plantations imported thousands of black slaves from various parts of Africa who spoke different languages but evolved a common dialect called Gula or Gola. In large parts of the South, blacks soon outnumbered whites and developed a distinct culture, including an African-American form of Christianity. Slavery prevailed even in Georgia, founded in 1732 by James Oglethorpe, as a refuge for free labor but open to slave labor by the 1750s. In the late 1600s, England sought tighter control over the American colonies. Navigation acts passed by Parliament specified that only English ships could visit, could visit American ports, uh, bear direct American trade with nations other than England, and impose duties on maritime trade between colonies. These acts were highly unpopular, but they spurred colonists to build their own ships, which counted as English vessels. No less controversial was the decision by King James II in 1688 to disband colonial assemblies and create a single dominion reaching from New Jersey to New England, ruled by a governor he appointed. Massachusetts ousted that governor after King James was deposed in 1688 and won restoration of separate colonies and their assemblies. Until the mid-1700s, tensions between colonists and the motherland were overshadowed by conflicts which the French and their Indian allies took advantage of. But problems refaced during the last of those struggles, the French and Indian War, which began in 1754. After a series of defeats, British authorities pressed colonists into service and forced them to house British troops at their own expense, triggering a riot in New York City. The British soon abandoned those incendiary measures, regained colonial support, and won a divisive battle at Quebec in 1759, securing control of Canada. Victory exposed a deep rift between Britain and the colonies over what to make of territory gained from France, uh, notably the fertile Ohio Valley. In 1763, Britain reached an accord with tribal chiefs, who ceded everything east of a line through the Appalachians in exchange for a ban on white settlement west of that line. Settlers on the frontier had long abhorred restrictions on western expansion and sp spurned the treaty. Even more offensive to colonists were British attempts to recover expenses of the recent war through measures such as the Stamp Act of 1765, which taxed newspapers and other printed materials. Many American colonists were now literate and resented a measure that penalized the press and imposed taxation without representation. 
Patrick Henry of Virginia argued forcibly that the power to raise taxes should rest not with Parliament, but with colonial assemblies responsible to the taxpayers. Parliament added fuel to the fire with the Tea Act of 1773, which, attempted, which exempted the British East India Company from taxes imposed on colonial importers of tea. Bostonians protested by dressing as Indians, boarding ships loaded with the company's tea and dumping it into the harbor. This Boston Tea Party led Parliament to pass the Coercive Acts, which closed the port of Boston and curbed the Massachusetts Assembly. In response, delegates from the 13 colonies met in Philadelphia in September 1774 for a uh, First Continental Congress, uh, which was, it was not planned, uh, it was not to go on record, uh, to spell out American grievances and approve military preparations for the defense of Massachusetts. Uh, the stage was set for the Revolutionary War. English Conquest of Canada The victory of General James Wolfe over the Marquis de Montcalm at Quebec in 1759 marked the high point of the British Empire in the New World and the beginning of its decline. Wolfe was a doomed figure even before the battle, gravely ill with tuberculosis. Yet he agreed to undertake this grueling campaign, knowing that the capture of Quebec might well decide the century-old struggle between Britain and France for control of North America. Ships carried his forces up the St. Lawrence to Quebec, perched high atop a cliff and seemingly impregnable. After laying siege to the city and failing to draw its defenders out, Wolfe and his troops scaled the cliff and surprised Montcalm's forces at the city's edge. In a furious battle on September the 13th that lasted barely an hour, both commanders were mortally wounded. Wolfe lived long enough to learn of his victory, however. Just days later, Quebec was in British hands, and the remaining French forces in Canada surrendered the next year. But this triumph contained the seeds of Britain's stunning defeat by American colonists in 1781. Once the French threat was removed, Americans felt less inclined to defer to the motherland and her troops. British-American relations w were further strained when Parliament taxed the colonists to cover the huge expense of winning the war. When Americans rebelled, the French took revenge on the British by siding with the colonists and playing a key role in the 1781 victory at Yorktown that clinched American independence and cut the heart out of Britain's New World Empire. Um, so as you can see, uh, because the Britain had won and they no longer... Um, and France was out, uh, the Americans no longer needed the British um, because they, they didn't, they, they didn't, it, they weren't, the France was no longer a problem at that time. And, um, and then when the Americans rebelled, the French then took revenge on the British um, by siding with the colonists and then playing a key role in that 1781 victory at Yorktown. And that's what was the clinch pin of American independence. And that's what originally led to the down, downfall of Britain's New World Empire.